In the next Riviera Firefly podcast, I'm going to be talking with Rachel Dickens, the English osteopath. We collaborated and worked together over the last 10 years, and more recently, Rachel and I and uh, Hannah from Riviera Nannies, Helen from Scape Design, agreed to meet for weekly peer-to-peer -peer coaching sessions. These I would highly recommend if you can set one of your own up because a mastermind keeps you focused, keeps you on target and holds you accountable. So focused have I been this year that I already have got the programme for this summer, for July and August, for our holiday camps at Kiddoland online and we're taking bookings. And with a fab partnership with the Golden Tulip Hotel in Valbonne from the 10th of July for two weeks, we're going to be doing everything in English, outdoor sports, tennis, swimming, table tennis. Parents can use their spa while we look after their kids. That was something that Rachel and my mastermind helped me focus on and get done. Another thing I've been focusing on is Adoland. I really wanted to bring a Duke of Edinburgh element to Adoland because when I was back in the UK, I saw that my cousins, kids, we're all doing community projects and community awareness. And I really wanted my children and their friends to have that here. So I've added that into the Adoland this year. We're going to go and see Guide Dogs for the Blind and find out what it's like to have a disability. We're going to go to Sunnybank and interview some of the seniors about their past and find out that they really had a history too. We're going to go to Jean Dufleur's, uh, the refuge, where we're going to find out about the dogs that unfortunately have to stay in the refuge and how they can be adopted out into families. And of course, we're going to do really fun activities and outings like salto and sailing and bowling and much, much more. Kiduland is our year round premises with 150 meters of aircon space where we run multi activity uh, all through the summer and art and cooking and theatre and yoga and there'll be outings and much, much more. And can you believe I've also got September inscriptions open? with new classes for getting ready for the CIV international tests and for Satu and Trois Collines, a new literacy club on Wednesday afternoons for Anglos that want to learn to read and write. And I'm going to be doing a live event to explain these uh, in May or June. So keep having a look at our Kiduland Facebook page, Kiduland Petite École Anglaise on Facebook, and we'll announce the date on there. So masterminds are amazing. If you're interested in finding out a little bit more, join my business community. It's the Riviera Firefly Cocoon. It's totally free. And in there, we kind of try to help and to share and support each other as a business, as small businesses, auto entrepreneurs here on the Côte d'Azur. If you don't have a business or you're just looking for some general community advice, some French uh, Riviera information, join the community group Côte d'Azur Living for all things Cote d'Azur. And all these links you can find on the Riviera Firefly website as links. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Rachel Dickens, the English osteopath. Having successfully launched three businesses, bilingual mum to two and entrepreneur Antonia Bozan brown has connected with thousands of people, both French and international, since moving to the French Riviera. These connections allow her to speak with successful local businesses and inspirational people about life here on the Côte d'Azur and share it with you. Welcome to the Riviera Firefly podcast with your host, entrepreneur, and my mum, Antonia Bozan brown the Riviera Firefly podcast of Rachel Dickens, the English osteopath. Hi Rachel, how Hello, are you? Hello Antonia, thank you for inviting me in. You're more than welcome. I'm, I'm a big fan of podcasts so I'm really pleased to for the first time be on one. Now that you've got your newfangled phone. Oh you can don't listen. talk to it, don't, yeah I know, <laughs> I'm, I'm one of these for the old school that just you know, what I would like to say old school, actually really what I mean is a serious business professional and I believe serious business professionals have blackberries because <laughs> they're for making phone calls and not for playing games on. And I've, I've unfortunately had to, Blackberry didn't keep up with the times and I've had to go to an Android phone and I'm just not happy with apps. But <laughs> I'm learning, I'm learning. Welcome to the club anyway. So I think we've known each other for I don't know probably as long as I've been here actually so about 11 12 years. Yeah, I've been here I've been here 16 17 so it and we would, used it would to have been yeah. Collaborate together uh, when you ran the baby Yeah, baby osteo. massage osteo. Yeah. Back in the day, long time ago. 
That's still going on, by the way. Where does that happen now? That happened. That then evolved into um, working with the Red Cross in the, the Croix Rouge in Antibes because they would make all our bookings for us. Basically, what we used to do is we used to offer the, a group of osteopaths used to offer free care and free osteo sessions to children that were put um, into us put through to us by the local doctors and some other local charities, um, especially children whose uh, parents were of modest incomes. And we used to run it and in Kiduland because that was a really good venue and Antonio gave it this, the room for free. So we used to run it every week or every two weeks. And then we, we um, evolved it and it's gone now with the Quarus because they do all the booking. So, um, Where do people got, find out about that? Uh, it's, called, it's now we've changed it to, to be called Osteo du Coeur. Okay. So, um, well, you'll give me yeah, the name I'll give you, of that, I'll give you that link. The, yeah, the and show notes. How old? How old are children, roughly? So, a, anybody that has a child, really, from newborn through to about twelve, really. And all um, the details on whether they're eligible will be anybody's for the free care anybody's and eligible. And you just have to phone up, pretty much. Fantastic. I mean, we don't have that many vacancies, and we do prioritise um, those that get sent to us via the PMU doctors. Um, but you know, we sometimes have spaces. Excellent service. Brilliant. So, uh, we're going to cast our minds back a little bit. Um, I'd like to know what made you decide to become an osteopath? I had an accident which left me paralysed um, for five months. And prior to that, I was, I'd was i been working with um, the Daily Mail General Trust as, a, as um, one of their assistant publishers. And then I moved on to the BBC. So I was kind of going a, more along that route in London. And then I had this accident that absolutely stopped me in my tracks. And I had to go back and live with my parents temporarily because obviously for the care, otherwise I'd be in hospital, but they couldn't do anything for me. And um, my mother then took me to see an osteopath. I'm literally, I'm talking carried in, walked out scenario. And one thing that happens when you're incapacitated like I was, it gives you an awful lot of time to think because somebody was paying my mortgage, somebody was feeding me, somebody was administering to all of all of my um, f all of my needs. And so all I had to do all day was just lie in bed and think. And, and you kind of think, well, who am I? Where am I? What am I doing in my life? It gives you that luxury, really. And it was at that time I'd seen the osteopath. And I thought then, I thought, I want to do to somebody what somebody's done to me. And so I, I looked um, for the information of how to become an osteopath and found that I nearly qualified, even though I'd already been to two universities. I thought, well, well let's give it a third. Um, I had to do an <laughs> access course because all my other universities were sort of, you know, um, arts and humanities type and philosophy, psychology things. And um, so I had to do a, a quick access course into the sciences. Um, that's probably the hardest course I've ever done in my life. And after that, I got in and... Um, and became an osteopath after five years of full-time gruelling study. So once you became an osteopath, this was all in England. Yes. Did you set up a practice there? What were the next steps? Halfway through, or maybe about halfway through my course, I was I had a lovely flat in Fulham, rue the day that I sold it, to be honest with mm -hmm. you, now with the property prices. I had this lovely flat in Fulham, and I looked out onto the, onto the road, to the buildings opposite, which were grey, and the road was grey, and the skies were grey. And I thought then, I thought, I don't want to die in grey. And so I thought, right, well, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll move to, I'll retire to the south of France. So I was thinking about that for a while, thinking, yeah, I mean, I'm talking, I was like 20... Six twenty-seven well, years old. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I like to plan ahead, <laughs> and um, and so I thought, well, I'll I'll um I retire to South of France, and I thought, well, if I retire there, I won't know anyone, so why don't I go there earlier and make some friends? And I thought, well, why don't I go there straight after this course I'm doing? Had a look around online, and I think there was online at that time, or just about, and um, realised that I could work down there. Well, it was kind of touch and go whether I could work down there as an osteopath, but there were there were ways around it. And in fact, the law changed literally seven days after I arrived down here, so I timed it quite well, and um, that made osteopathy legal. And so I thought, right, I will then set set that about. So I didn't actually really work in the UK. However, after I finished my studies, there was a gap of about four months before I could move move down here, and I worked with other other practices there. So. Go back to what you said about osteopathy legal, because that, that's a different mindset. So we, lots of us coming from England, for example, it's been a lot more in the everyday, hasn't it, osteopathy than here. It, it was slower on the uptake here it was back in the day. It, well, 
The difference here is, is how the whole of the medical profession is run. I mean, it's, it's quite competitive here. In the UK, because all doctors are paid by the government, pretty much, I mean, there are different fund holding, well, well that's all been got rid of, hasn't it? Um, they kind of collaborate. Here, the more patients you have, the more money you get. So everybody's really sort of, oh, no, that's my patient. No, oh, hands off, that's mine. Which is really not very conducive to the best care of the patient, I find, personally. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, the doctors um, who have a big say in, in the government and, and, and in power, they didn't want osteopaths in the mix, as it were, because we'd be taking away money from them. It's okay. plain and simple. Always is, isn't it? It's always money. Yeah, yeah. And so it was only in 2001, October 2001, that they actually changed the law to make it not legal but not illegal. And then five years later, they put the act through to actually make it legal, although there are some um, checks and balances which we don't have in the UK. Um, like, we can't prescribe anything, whereas we can in the UK. Um we can't treat ch babies under the age of six months unless we have a letter from their doctor to say that, you know, we're not going to cause any damage and stuff like this. So well, there's a few little checks and balances. Fresh off the jet plane, you've done a little bit of uh, work experience with the people down here and then you must have gone and looked for your own cabinet. Yeah, when I moved down here, um, I, I rented a, a lovely little place in Ontario with the downstairs of a villa and um, which had parking and everything so I thought well we set off here because I could use one of the spare bedrooms you know as a, as a clinic room and it was really really lovely um, and then after about six or seven months just to see how you know how it was going I had you know I'm I look I, I made a profit in my first month from being down here so you know covered all the expenses so I knew it was working well and then about six months later I am um, I got a little place in Antibes kind of near the port in in Rue Vauban. Yeah I think that's where I went. That's where you went yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean I'm still in Rue Vauban now I've moved up the road a little yeah, bit because yeah. we've got a, a bigger cabinet there which is is much nicer and much lighter. But, one, um, one of the brilliant things I think that you did in the early days, it was kind of a community, so putting back into the community, but an excellent way for you to make friends and to meet people with the Pilates classes. I know. Where well, did you come up with that idea? Well, I can't remember how I came up with that idea. It was so long ago, but I knew, <laughs> I knew it was because I started them off in my garden as well in the summer, <laughs> I, I remember, in, in that, that little video. So it was quite early when I, um, quite soon after when I moved down here. I think it, it, I think it comes from the fact that when people, a lot of people move down here, they're either moved down with a partner or they've got kids or they're moving in for a job. I had neither of those three things. And, um, and you can't really make, you're not really allowed to make friends with your patients. You know, even though you might get on really well in the clinic, as an osteo, you're not allowed to say, oh, you know, do you fancy a drink? Because then it puts them in the position where they feel they have to say yes and then da 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 learn. It's, it's kind of that thing that's not allowed in, a, in our profession. So there's a, there's a line that I couldn't cross. And so I just thought, well, let's start this up and at least I can then talk to people sort of on a one-to-one -one basis and, and, and be allowed to sort of connect Inspired. with them a little bit more it's very, a great idea because it is hard isn't it when you first move here getting to know people oh god when i moved down here i mean i came from i had a load of friends in the uk and or, and still do but when i came down here i didn't know anybody at all and i came down here on my own and i would go and sit in bars and i'd kind of think right okay i've got to go out tonight i didn't really want to go out because i was on my own I thought okay go out go and sit in a pub and i would sit in a pub you know, just trying to um, connect with people and things like that. And and I had oh, some sure, really I no. I was going. To, I, I, was, I was going to the English pubs, uh, English pubs and bars. And and I had some really disastrous evenings where you know there was one in particular where this guy who was like spewing cashew nuts all over me from the gap in his teeth, telling me about U-boat campaigns in World War Two. And it was just like, and I was kind of having to pretend that I was kind of engaging and interested in what he was saying, only because otherwise I'd just go and sit at home and read a book all by myself. Self so and Pilates things. lessons were a better way. For yeah, and also I'm very, I'm very aware of other people who are sitting on their own in in bars and pubs and stuff, and you know because they might have be the most incredible person and have thousands of friends and and really good fun and that and it's just through circumstance that they're in a place without their friends. So I usually make an effort and go and include them and say, oh, do you want to join our table and things like that. And there wasn't back then Facebook, so now you there was Anglo Info. Like, well, there was Anglo Info. Anglo Info, yeah, was, actually, was, amazing, yeah. Anglo -info was actually one it of my was, uh... saving saving things. And actually, before ah, this is it. Before I moved down here, I, I was on Anglo Info, you know, saying where would be this, that, and the other. 
And and somebody um, connected with me then, and um, was really really helpful with the information. And he's kind of still one of my best friends now. And he's That's almost lovely. like my family now. Wow. You know, and I'll do anything for him, and he'll do anything for me because we've, you know, we've stayed friends for well seventeen years now. So I actually did know one person. <laughs> I did know one person, but I had never met him. It was kind of like that. And the Riviera Fit Mums, you join. I know I've seen you you're quite active. You've met loads of people through that one. I that have Facebook met group. loads of people, and they've been really, really great people. Um, and we've done loads of things together. I've set up a, a little um, a dining club, which is... How some... does that work? Okay, when my, my mother used to have her gourmet group it was called Pam's gourmet group and um, she's got every month and there was t- I think there were 10 ladies and in in the area where we lived and I'm, I'm, I'm talking went on for like 37 years and, until she died and um, every month they would go and um, one person would cook and it was to a theme they'd have a theme for the whole year whether it was you know like a country or a color or a special ingredient or something like that and um and it just went really well, and it actually w- ended up more uh, more than just dinner. It was a support group because these ladies supported each other. There was life and death, and relationship breakups, and makeups, and and pretty much the whole the whole thing that you can expect with a whole group of women over thirty seven years. Wow. And um, and she got a lot of, she got a lot of support and comfort from that. And then a few a couple of years ago, I was really thinking, saying, you know what, I really need to do that in my mum's honour. As yeah. well as as well as what I needed to do for me, and so um and so there was I thought right I don't just want my friends there because I know my friends and I see my friends I want people that I find really interesting and intriguing and I don't even know them very well and there were a few people that I'd met through various social events and I thought and I didn't really know them and I thought okay I'm going to reach out to them and ask them if they'd be interested and so I, there was actually two people that I knew really well in. I Which gives you a bit of support when you start something up, doesn't yeah. it? Because you know you've got a wing, wing buddy or something. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and stuff. And and now all these other groups, and some of them I'd met through the Fit Mums, or I'd seen them on the periphery uh, of groups in Fit Mums. And I invited these people, and they all said yes. And we've now just had our f- year anniversary. Wow. And it's really, really a good group. And we're all completely different. We're, there's Russian, there's German, there's Canadian. Um, they're different age groups. And some have kids, some have not. Some are getting divorced, some are in relationships, and some are just carrying on. It's, it's just it's lovely. It's a great thing to do. And I, I did something, set something similar up. It was a brunch club, I called it. Um, and it was a similar thing. I, Some people I knew, some people I didn't know. And yeah. sent out this email to them going, OK, I've got this idea. And the idea was, well, I'm not a big fan of cooking, right? so the idea was everyone brings a dish and I'll provide the plates come out to my house. Perfect. And then you turn, you know, you go to someone else's house. Yeah. And like you say, it was a great way, a great... And they have some of my best friends down here now. Yeah. Didn't know them that well, but, you know, you get that kind of glimmer of chemistry and you're like... That's oh, right. I'd like when, to get to know yeah, you a bit more. Exactly. When something thing. intrigues you and you think, oh, I'm sure if I knew you better, you'd be my friend. People should try it, you know, if you've just arrived here. It's a great... I, a couple of great ideas. Though, absol- so. Absolutely. And you get so, you get so much from it as well um as we say with our um with our gourmet group um it's not about the food i mean that's a lot that's <laughs> yeah. the last thing it's about we don't care if you can cook or not cook mm-hmm. it's more about the uh the, the little community that we've just grown and are you in a book club as well or have been uh, well i i've been moaning for years and years that nobody's ever invited me to a book club and i have a degree in english literature and therefore <laughs> i know everything about books and that's probably why nobody's invited me because i'm quite pushy probably um <laughs> yes, you might be too cerebral for my <laughs> no, yeah and so no and i was just like oh well nobody invites me to anything even though for a long time i didn't have time however i've had time in the last couple of years and then someone's actually invited me and i was so honored and i've actually only read one of the books i even proposed i even proposed my own book then i didn't even read that but, oh, I, no. didn't, but I haven't told them that yet <laughs> um, and, um and i haven't really had the Between time to you do and it me, i don't always read my books so you got, in my book club but you but, go along and yeah, you can join me, but that but again our, our book club is not about is not about the books. It's more about the lunch. Okay. So we, we, it's called the Chicklet Lunch Club, actually. So um, so I, to be honest, we've just got our dates for the next lunch. I don't even know. This is how little I'm connected with the girl. I don't even know what the book is that we're supposed to be reading. So, but my, you know, I'm last, very good at lunch. My last two book clubs. Uh, I, well, the one coming up, I'd already read the book last summer. So well done, like, you. <laughs> and the one before, I'd already read as well. So that's like, yeah. I don't know how great. your book club goes, but our book club is. I think we have a maximum of ten minutes to talk about the book, and that's it, as a group <laughs> in total before we order before we start talking about lunch. I can't possibly disclose because Mr. BB thinks it's wine club already. My one. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great ideas for people to meet um, meet new people. 
You've managed to get out and about, I imagine, loads through your work, because uh, you do call-outs, don't you? Yeah. In the summer. People can either come to your two cabinets now. So you, we only talked about the one in Antibes, but there's another one now. There's another one. We call it Monaco. It's actually in, uh, administratively in Beausoleil. We're, we're 64 metres from the border, and all of our patients live pretty much in Monaco. So. And that's brilliant. How long's that one been open for? That's, I think it's six or seven years now. And, and just what, invite all our What's the clients. difference between the Antibes and the Monaco in terms of the different practitioners that are there? Um, Antibes... Who do we have? We have Roman in Antibes, and he's really busy. Antibes is, is just such a busy, busy clinic. Um, and then we have... So Roman's Philippa. osteopathy. He's the osteo, yeah. Um, then we have Philippa, who does uh, traditional Chinese medicine. And we have Shona, who does massage. We've just started doing the uh, Seafarer Yacht Medicals. We've got a doctor, uh, Michelle Ozel, who's... This is hot off the press, This is it? hot off yeah. the press. This is something we've been trying for for, like, six years. Um, it's the, the hoops... We've had to go through the doors that we've had to, you know, open by kicking them in. Um, it's just been incredible, incredibly hard. And we're so pleased that we've now got this. So it's another great crew service. So, so this means that people working on the yachts now can just literally walk off their yacht, yeah. pop into you because you're right by the yeah. port and get their oh, I mean, medical what, checks done. We've been, we've been at various governments because it, it has to be a government-led um, um, initiative. We've been in contact with various governments saying, just for the crew, because they, they all ask us, do you do the medicals? And we're like, no, we don't. So we thought, well, let's see if we can help them. So we've been sort of campaigning on their behalf to, to various governments, say, look, they need um, a seafarer a medical certificate exam a little bit closer to where they are actually based. Um, and 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 there wasn't enough, and, and they need a they need this service to get their seafarer certificates closer to where they are because they don't have cars. A lot of these guys, no, of um, and so we've been said no, 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 so many times. And we actually found a way. We actually went finally through the Norwegian government and said, look, this is getting a bit of a crisis in Antibes. There's needs. There's so many um, seafarers and not enough people that do it. And and the nearest people, you know, you have to get a taxi or a bus to. And finally, Norwegian said, yes, that's fine. So the consul flew down to meet us. They had to approve the clinic. Then they had to get our doctor. We had to fly him over to Norway sit um, uh, for three days to sit a medical maritime certificate. And, um, yep, then we had to go through a few other hoops. And we're and now there. open for tickets. business. It's just so great for a crew that we can just say, yes, we do. It, and you can book online. And that's what I was just going to ask. Your, your book online system is fantastic. It and works. Was, it's the future, isn't it? Because... Even the hairdresser up in Chateauneuf the other day, when I go to think about it, it's always at a time when the places are closed yeah. for lunch, which we'll talk about after, but, <laughs> you know, you go, oh, I'm just going to call, oh, they're shut. I know. Because your busy day maybe stops at 12, and then you pick up the phone, or your busy day finishes at 6, and then you're like, oh, I'm going to make my appointments. And the, yeah, and also the other thing is, is uh, I mean, we get so many um, things come through because it sends me an, an email direct, at, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock at night, you know, when people are actually making their booking. So we actually know when people are, are actually using the service. But the other thing is, is you wake up at night, 3 o'clock in the morning, whatever, huge pain somewhere. And you're thinking, oh, God, OK, I'll, I'll get that sorted out. You have to wait till 9 o'clock in the morning to book it. And then they're already booked up, and then they don't answer their phone, da 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 Whereas you can just book straight in. And, yeah, and if yeah. the 9 o'clock slot's available, bang it, you're in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's really, really great for, for people. Um, it is, because and and it's, it's actually genius, because <sighs> the amount of times so with a doctor, you wake up, and like you say, yeah. 9 o'clock, and it's engaged. Yeah. Then when you finally get through, it's 12 o'clock, they've got nothing left. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's brilliant. People only come and see us when it's almost too late. If people came to see us before they even had pain, then they would never really get into that pain situation. What I, what I say to people, I, 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 I have a little stick in, or a pen or something, and I say, right at the top where the, the biro bit is, I say, that's where you are now in your pain. I say, we can sort you out and we'll get you, and I move it down like two centimetres. I say, you know, we get you to there. This is when you didn't have pain. But you know what? You're so close to actually going up to the pain bit again. If you then come to see us again and again and again, and I put my finger down and down and down the pen, I say, that's where we can actually get you into a place which is so far away from you getting into pain. But... 
It doesn't. It does even even though osteopathy for an awful lot of our clients is paid for a hundred percent because they have international insurance. They still don't. Even some mutuals, I think you get yeah. um, a one a year or something. I've got, no mutuals. It... Mutuals are really changing now. There's somebody just had a mutual in the office the other day, and it pays fifty euros of every treatment, mm. unlimited. And, and, you know, we charge 70 for a, a mm. cabinet um, appointment. So, you know, they're only paying 20 bucks. Uh, who is over in the Monaco office, then? In the Monaco office, we have another osteopath. We've got Charles, lovely Charles. And, oh, my goodness, we've got so many other things there. We have a clinical nutritionist, Udi. We've got two masseuses, um, really good ones, and a reflexologist, Louise. We have a nurse, um, Virginie. We have um, the um, the traditional Chinese medicine, um, Philippa, goes over there as well. And well, in total, we have 16 therapists, 16 different therapists. Well, it must keep you very, very busy. It doesn't, actually. No? <laughs> no. It doesn't, because, well, it Excellent. did. It did for so long, and uh, it was just ridiculous how difficult it is, to, as you know, to set up a business here and how much time it takes and, and the admin and the fact it's so difficult employing people because it costs so much da, 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 so you have to do a lot without all that um, but I've got to a stage where I've massively stepped back, I've got a full time osteo in Onsi, a full time osteo in Monaco and um, I just fanny about really. <laughs> well don't, you work the hours you want to work. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to be in clinic that much, I mean in the summer yes I'm, and just today actually the reason I was a little bit late for the um, this podcast session was because I just did a call out on the capped on team so, because the other two are busy so the third one, the third man who's hopefully always me is the one that just picks up the stuff the others can't get to. But it is, I'm really, it keeps coming into my head all the time at the moment is this whole you're never going to get to the end of your days going I wish I work more and we're here in the south of France yeah you know the, you love skiing don't you you're up skiing a lot you're out paddle boarding or what so what do you do you kayak I kayak I kayak well I paddle board as well I ski I paddle board and I kayak and I hike and that's pretty much that's ama yeah, amazing. what I love to do in, in all my other days and, and, and having sure lots of lunch <laughs> Yeah, yeah, reading books. No, no but, but, yeah, but but then this is me. Okay, so I love to ski. So I got involved in a skiing, uh, a charity which involves skiing, and now I do their website. I do their social media. I do a lot of their recruitment for the the guys that we take skiing. And it's actually instead of you know what I thought initially be oh yeah it'd be great week skiing year. It's actually a year round volunteer work which. I mean, I had an hour-long conversation with somebody on the phone yesterday about one of the other things we're implementing there, and pretty much I, I probably spend about five hours a week. All and the year name around. of it, so share the name. It's, well, it was called Skiing with Heroes, um, but we've changed our name to Supporting Wounded Veterans because the skiing is only one part Supporting of what we do. Supporting Wounded Veterans. Supporting okay. Wounded Veterans. And I'm bringing ten wonderfully lovely wounded veterans down to, um, to here, actually, in June. And we're, I'm going to run a couple of fundraising events. One, which is a, a closed one in Monaco, um, a quiz night. Um, it's, there's only sort of 60 people can be invited, so it's invite only for that. And, um, and we did this two years ago, and we got 42,000 profit in three hours. So that's why it's closed, because we have to be careful with who we invite. Um, let's just say I probably wouldn't be invited unless I actually ran it. <laughs> um, and the second one I'm doing, so, and I thought, well, that was great, but nobody down here got to meet the guys. They're all men, actually, I'm bringing over. Well, I think they are. And um, so I'm going to do a fabulous treasure hunt, because they're my favourite things to that do in fun. cars. Yeah, so, Tell us more. How's that work? Well, the idea is that we'll all... So people buy, it's only 35 euros for the ticket. Kids go free. So mm -hmm. if your family, it won't cost you, hopefully not much. And all that money goes direct to the charity. It's, it, it's one of those charities we don't have a CEO. We don't have paid employees. We've got one admin staff and, and a couple of people on special projects that we have to so have. So it's a treasure hunt in a car. Yeah. So all the money goes directly to the charity. And you, you turn up and I give you a list of 20 things to find. And everybody starts at the same time. And you just drive around. It could be... Things to find, it could be things you one person has to be photographed on a, on a paddleboard, one of your team. Um, <laughs> you might have to have do a selfie with a killer whale, so how you manage to organise that. I mean, it's going to be, uh, look, it's a charity event. You can bribe the judges, let's just say that. Um, it could be like you've got to stand, you've got to have two people in your team standing under a waterfall. So you've got to think, oh, where's the quickest waterfall? Work out which route you're going to take um, and things like that. And then at the end, um, we'll have all the soldiers there. 
I think if people have got space in their cars, they can take a soldier with them, which is always good fun. Um, and um, at the end, then there'll be sort of, we'll meet in Valbon, depending on how many people are going to be there, and we'll just sit around with the soldiers and people want to actually have a chat with them. <laughs> and then in the evening, we're actually doing a, a proper dinner for 135 people. And how do people find out more about that and register their car, I guess, for their team? Um, there will be information on the Facebook pages. Well, there'll be information on my website, for a start, englishosteopath.com, and there will be information on the pages down here, um, Valbon, Car Boot, Auntie Buy It, Sell It, which most people are, know about. And um, the Riviera Radio are going to publicise it for free as well. And what their, date is on? that? June the 10th. Saturday, June the 10th. Saturday, June the 10th. It's going to be... It's loads of fun. It's, it is. It's just going to be such a laugh. And I think, and it can be really creative. for a teenager to get a moment to speak with a veteran, Yeah. to have that bit of world knowledge yeah. in a nice way, Yeah. could be a really useful thing to train our future generation. Now, now, the other thing is, is these soldiers are incredibly inspirational mm. um, for what they've been through and how they're coping with their, with their injuries. And... Um, we will be auctioning at some stage um, in one of the events um, a, a buddy place so you can actually come and ski with us. Now, if anybody has some teenagers that need a right kick up the inspiration, um, <laughs> then um, they can maybe bid for that and, and come and have a chat with us and see because, you know, we'll, it's, it's, it's not like rehab, but I tell you something, it will change them. You can't, you can't spend a week with soldiers who are learning to ski, who don't have eyes or legs and only half a brain because they've been blown up and not come back a changed person. Mm -hmm. So skiing obviously is a passion of yours. Yes. Where, uh, where are your favourite places to go and ski? Well, I ski a lot in Closters in Switzerland, which is quite grand, which yeah. is lovely. And it's only because I get loads of free accommodation there. And, um, and that's a really nice community there as well. Down here, I lo I I'll ski anywhere. I'm not, the, I'm not, even though I do all this skiing, I'm not the best technical skier. I just love being up in the mountains. And actually, if I didn't ever have to ski again, it wouldn't bother me. But I'd, I'd just like to stay up in the mountains. So, I mean, my ideal skiing place is anywhere with snow and, and a good scenery. I like to ski hard all morning, have a lunch and then go home. <laughs> um, and that's it. And then just sit in a fire looking at the mountains, reading a book, usually with a wet dog on my legs. Yeah, it's a very calming my feet. place to be, isn't it? Oh, well, I, I my love favourite moment is on a ski lift when you're on your own and you can just hear salt water. You can't hear anything. It's silence. You just yeah. hear the snow that's, creaking as you're going up. That's what ski de fond or cross skiing is about, though, because then it's really quiet. Yeah. Mm, it, yeah, and I hate snowboarders because they make so... <laughs> all that <laughs> noise coming from behind you. I hate it. And where do you do paddleboarding and kayaking to? Um, paddleboarding I usually just do around the coast here, um, the Bay de Milliardaires and the Plage des Andes in Antibes. Um, kayaking, I, I am a yacht owner of a... What is it? <laughs> three, is it three or four metre? Three, four metre yacht, which is actually a blow-up kayak. Um, and I kayak over to the islands quite often. Or I kayak again round the Bay de Milliardaires because um, that's great snorkelling. I love to snorkel, so I snorkel kayak. Aww. And it's lovely. I'm going to have to try, try some of that this year. I'm writing you a list of things to do You can come with summer. me. I've got, I've got a spare place. <laughs> yeah, have you, are you ever worried about like the passing big yachts going between you and the islands as you're going out? Oh, my God, that is really... It's really cat and mouse, that bit is. Yeah, you have to time it and you have to paddle so hard to get... Because they come in so fast. And, and they... I mean, it's literally... And they don't see every, you it's, it's almost like every 20 seconds mm. that they, they're coming in, so... Yeah, they, they, they're quite good at seeing. Um, they, the yacht crew here are quite good at knowing there's lots of little paddleboarders and kayakers out in the islands. But that is, that's probably the most dangerous thing, part of the trip. And what about your French? Did you speak French before you came down here? Luckily enough, yes. I was um, one of those kids that, that just do languages. And I was, uh, I was at a progressive school and we were taught French from the age of seven. So I've never worried about French and before I did come down here actually I just thought well I need to like you know up it and so I spent a month um, at the well I spent two months actually I was lucky to have that time off it was a couple of years it was two two years before I came down here I did a month just in the VAR in sort of like a little house just to get tune in <laughs> tune in because you need that and then the next month um, I went to the Institut Francais in villefranche sur mer and um, that was incredible because it it was the only thing that's ever stopped me talking. <laughs> because I realised my French was so bad, my grammar was so bad, I just 
stopped for like three days and I could not utter a word. And then when I started speaking again, my French was quite beautiful when it came out. So it's like, phew. <laughs> but that's fa- great. Do you have a favourite saying? Favorite my favourite saying is, uh, c'est noté. <laughs> c'est noté, madame. Oui, c'est noté. C'est noté. Because that's all you ever hear in admin France. <laughs> oh, admin France. I mean, we did, um, you know, m- m- setting up our own companies and what have you, it's certainly quite challenging isn't it i guess in any country well it's harder in your second it, language it, well it's it's harder in your second language because you don't understand the culture you know even like with the tax and the thing you know we're not taxed at source and you have to declare it and then just because you declare your tax to the ampo it doesn't mean to say that the cpav people haven't and the and you had that whole nightmare with the denoncé i've been denounced twice so den- den- I, I take so I, someone that doesn't know, doesn't know what company I, means. i'm so optimistic i take it as uh, i take it as flattery <laughs> So someone basically called in and said, oh, you should check their accounts. Yeah, it's basically mm. what happens in, in business if, is if you don't like somebody or you think they're taking your market share or that you think whatever. Basically, it's if somebody's more successful than you is pretty much how it happens. Um, yeah, you get denounced and they call in and then you either are given a full tax investigation, a, um, a control fiscal or not. And I've been done twice, and um, I don't know anybody else who's been done twice. And they haven't found anything. I mean, we're talking sort of like a five-month full-on tax investigations with meetings every week. And you and they, they come to your house with all of your bank statements for the last three or five years. And, um, and so, you know, then you have to go through everything. And after five months, my first tax investigation, they, charge, they find me, because they have to fine you, €112. Euro. And you think, is this the best way for my tax money to be spent? And it's not. But, um, yeah, it's to tough. It it's French tough. Well, it, it, well I, I kind of think, well, it's good exercise for me to do it in French. You know, you have to make the most positive part. Um, you have to be positive about things. But um, and what's inspirational is uh, you haven't let that keep you down. And you did then go, you know, still go and open up. You know. But but this is the other thing, is is making advantage of every situation or taking advantage of every situation. On my first tax investigation, it was at that time we were paying VAT or TVA in France as osteopaths. And the law was just about to change or just changing to say that osteopaths don't have to pay TVA anymore because we are considered medical. And, um, and so I told this to the tax investigation team and they actually got me signed off a year earlier than anybody else because I showed them all the uh, the things so as they were doing all my tax and so and that saved me thousands mm. thanks for the guy or girl that denounced me you know <laughs> and you just have you just have to be really positive and really optimistic and you just have to you know share the the not so much the wealth as such but but share the business and you know and and promote promote each other and that's kind of what we do well, that's, I've got to know you even more recently because we've joined in a mastermind since January, didn't we, with Indeed. a couple of other very special people. And they're very special moments, even in our busy schedules. And even, uh, you know, in the last couple of weeks, we've had issues. I had one, someone else had one that throw up. And there's this kind of support. Of yeah, support. support of people that have, who are in business and they know pretty much what they're and talking about. And just amazing about. minds, yeah. all very different businesses and different ways of looking at the same problem yeah has it's, really helped yeah. solve and i think it's anyone out there should set their own masterminds up because it's such a great idea everybody in business needs a mentor yeah. i mean i've been i've been looking for a mentor for a couple of years and because in our in our um, um scheme with heroes supporting wounded veterans we give each veteran a mentor um for the whole year completely for free and we choose their mentors really well for them and since I've been involved in that charity, I've wanted a mentor myself, and and now I have one. I have a whole group. Yeah. Well, I have what? Well, there's four of us, so yeah, I have yeah. three mentors that we mentor each other in a group, and uh, it's just the best thing. Yeah, it it's really the makes best you thing. stronger, doesn't it? Particularly if you're working for yourself. I would say even just Get the benefit together. of getting together with similar sized businesses, yeah. uh, similar so, problems. Yeah, that three, you can... three or four people, I would say, um, and then just make the time absolutely ring fence that time and because this is the other old maxim you can't work on your business when you're working in your business and it's all about working on your business so get away from your business just for that hour long meeting each week and and it's amazing how you know how much we're pushing through and how much you think yeah yeah I'm doing that I'm doing that until somebody says what have you actually done this week and can you just 
make sure that you have done it and you think <gasps> yeah because we hold each other accountable absolutely when i left our, our last week's one i literally came back with a list of about five ten things and banged them all off and that day yeah <laughs> like, right, i can go home now and one of them <laughs> and one of them one of them was a a, a checklist book for me thank you <laughs> and just welcome. gave me thank you <laughs> which is what i needed well, it's great to see uh, how positive um, things are for you moving forward 2017. So you've got the all the yachties now that can come to see you. Yes. You've got the veterans coming over. Yes. Any other things that are on the horizon that you want to share? Or is well, it to be... Well, I'm planning on opening up a, another English osteopath. Um, I don't want to open it in France, but... Uh, because it's it's just so difficult, um, and and there's also you know the taxing. The more you earn, you know, the less you actually get. So what's the point really, of um, putting all that effort in for, you know, not that much result, or not that much return. So I'm sort of going around the world thinking where can I open one, and I'm I'm kind of toying with Nigeria which you know might actually be easier to sell business in than France you never know <laughs> now I'm doing a lot I'm doing lots of I'm doing lots of um, research and, and and Nigeria just keeps coming up as top of the list so I might have to just pop off there um sometime this year and just go and search it out and see if we can and and again it's working on the expat community um with uh, their health insurance and their need to actually have western medical people that can understand their, you know, their their cultural needs as well, and um, when when we're talking medical, well, keep us posted. I yes. want to hear all about that. Yeah, um, I want to be able to say it. <laughs> so yeah, that's good. yeah, yeah. 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 Well, but and also because you've already got the model there, you've done yeah. it on T, then you've ah. done Monaco. So actually, you know how to roll it out now. The online booking's already in place. All I need is is pretty much the the venue. Um, the clinic, and um, I know how to get some osteopaths. I've already got a manager already lined up. See, I'm actually probably doing more than actually just thinking about it. I've already got a manager, I've already got a manager lined up in, in the UK, if, if it goes ahead. So, I, I, you know, I've got everybody in place. I've just got to sort of connect it all and find the time to connect it all. That's yeah. what the thing is, isn't it? Make the time. Well, it'll happen when it was meant to happen. I firm believe it'll happen when that. my support mentoring group tell me yeah. to make it happen. Oh, yeah, we know it's on. The, we know it's on the to-do list. I think we know you've yes. got other big things just coming up in the summer. So. But but that's the point, isn't it? Is it to to make it a little bit more high profile on the to-do list? All right then. Next week then. I'll keep my <laughs> video up yeah. for you. What yeah. about sort of the whole um, being in France? Uh, are there any customs and traditions that you enjoy, or are there you know, have you managed to blend in and, and, and get used to the way I'm of life? Pre I'm pretty blended. Okay, look, all my friends and my social life is the expat community, without a doubt. Um, but I I know what's going on. I know I've got great neighbours. I I'm part of their family. Um, I've got a few French friends and, and things. I know what's going on in the in the local town and I take part in, in the cultural stuff. We go to the opera here and the ballet and theatre and things. Um, French traditions, uh, well, lunch, really. Um, <laughs> I love it and I hate it. I love it because for... For a, for a whole community and population to be able to like stop for like two hours a day, you know, and 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 not have to be on that treadmill of working, I think is incredibly important and healthy, and I love it. Um, and I hate it for the fact because I'm trying to do business and you can't get anything done at that time and, and things. Go. Well, I'm going to let you go because it looks like you've got a very incredibly busy couple of months and you've got to go and do some work on your Nigeria project. I have <laughs> now because I'll put it on my check in my checklist book. Next mastermind. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me. It's been it's it's always a pleasure for people to um, ask you about yourself. So <laughs> it really is. So thank thank you. you. And uh, so EnglishOsteopath.com. Um, and the Croix Rouge as well, we'll put those the in the, uh, the show notes. And just want people to sign up now for... For if they want to take part in our veterans um, fundraising event. Brilliant. I mean, because the, as I'm trying to promote it, it's like, when was the last time you were in a bar with somebody who took their leg off, filled it up with beer or whatever, and then made everybody drink from it? <laughs> you know, these are experiences you don't normally get down here. This is true. Very, very true. <laughs> well, Rachel Dickens, the English osteopath com. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Antonia. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Riviera Firefly for Cocked As You Are Living by your host and my mum, Antonia Beauvoisin-Brown. Please subscribe, like and share. Until next time.